bang, 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 yes, you'll see a lot of this in today's episode. Thanks to the powerful Swedish infantry and a fairly decent economy, turning the Baltic Sea into a Swedish lake will just be a stop, on the way to becoming the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, and a Protestant one at that. Welcome, imperialists, Lucas here. You don't know how long I've wanted to play a campaign as Sweden again. I've played a few times, but always felt a great dissatisfaction and the country's untapped potential. This episode will be different. Sweden starts the game as a member of the Kalmar Union, a kind of federation of states, dependent on the Kingdom of Denmark, whose first king was Erik of Pomerania. Yes, he's the current ruler of Gotland. He fled there after being overthrown and started playing pirate. The union lasted until Sweden declared its Swexit. Overall, Gustav Vasa assembled an army and fought for Sweden's freedom. And I'll follow exactly the same path, only I'll win that freedom much quicker. Then I'll aim for significant expansion with Sweden in the Baltic region, Lubeck and Novgorod, just by the way. Sweden's problem is its very poor initial economy and the fact that we can't field a very large army. Fortunately, thanks to national ideas, this army is really tough at the beginning. And we can also have cheaper mercenaries. A very big advantage of Sweden is its missions. They are very enjoyable enjoyable to play, nicely arranged, and develop further when we create Scandinavia. Because yes, it's now worth it to create Scandinavia with Sweden. And what's best, it will be different from Scandinavia created with Norway or Denmark. Let's start by executing all these missions that will help us gain freedom. First, I send envoys to all of Denmark's rivals to ask for their support for our freedom. Then, I improve relations with Burgundy and the Czech Republic above 100 to be able to complete this mission. Now, let's take care of the support of the estates. Since we initially have less land, I take only two privileges for points, standard cheaper advisors, additionally religious diplomats from the clergy, supremacy over the crown from the nobility. And if I didn't have England's support in this war, I'd ask the burghers to sponsor a few warships for us. But since I have England's support, I won't need a fleet here. So, I'll take a loan, cheaper shipbuilding, and grant the burghers economic freedom. I perform a trick for a cheaper military advisor, which allowed me to get a cheaper advisor with morale. I change the military stance to administrative. Additionally, we hire a free company because it's the cheapest, though I won't hide that the Finnish company has a really interesting commander. From our regular army, I dismiss all the cavalry because it's simply too expensive. Not even a month passed, and we're ready for the war of independence, the Engelbrecht Rebellion. The time of our independence is at hand. A new leader arises, Johann Vasa will be our new commander, and then after winning the new king of Sweden. I'll also mention that I always find the nod to Braveheart here funny. And almost at the end, support from the estate. I totally forgot we'd get an even cheaper military command from the burghers, additional ships, but England supports us, so we don't need this. And in the end, we'd get support from the clergy and the papacy. It must be said, the Pope might really suffer for this later. And you won't believe it, but I'll accept help from the clergy. Although to get rid of these negative privileges we'll receive, we'll have to repay our debt. Let's ask the Pope to bless our ruler to get a bit more army morale. And then I'll ask for additional percentages from church taxes, because it will be easier to stir up Sweden's economy. Sorry, that's how it works in this game, that taxes are good. And with allies, I'll wait a bit. Six months before the war, of course, I turn off the maintenance for forts and the army again, and because I know I'll forget about it, I turn on defensive edicts on our border with the Danes, because the first strike will likely go towards Norway, in theory. And so in January 1447, I sent a request to all of Denmark's rivals for support in the War of Independence. Alternatively, I could have stood alone in this fight, but since someone else can fight for me, why not take advantage of it? Wonderful. Burgundy and the Czech Republic will support us in our quest for independence. The army marches on the unsuspecting Norwegians, and I forgot to have a free diplomat, seriously, and I declared the war of independence on January 12th. Wasn't Vasa supposed to rule me? Ah, I read further, he will rule after this war if we make it in time. Definitely, for sure. Let's raise our stability by plus one and then declare our independence. It's clear we completely surprised the Norwegians, utterly defeating their army. Too bad Vasa isn't the best at sieges. Oh well, then I defeat a smaller enemy army completely. Those peasants stood no chance. We also overpowered the Teutonic Order, but not completely this time. I can't believe the Danes do this all the time. Oh no, they defeated those rebels, and I wanted to take over the fortresses. From the Teutonic Order, I only take war reparations because I plan to attack them again in five years, maybe. Unfortunately, Poland has allied with Gotland. The Netherlands is very nice, clearing all the occupations I had. And not even a year later, I can demand independence and war reparations from the Danes, but unfortunately, not their capital. So the war must go on a bit longer. I 
I seized the right moment when the Danish fleet lost to the English fleet. Now it's time to capture the Danish capital. As a result of this war, I not only gain independence, but also acquire several Danish provinces, most importantly their capital, plus war reparations. Allies surprisingly aren't upset. This marks the beginning of the Great Swedish Kingdom era, led by Johan Vasa. God, Johan Vasa, seriously? Taking Sealand in this war was crucial because it's a very good trading province which will help us quickly manage our trade in Lübeck. I can also demolish local fortresses as they are no longer needed. After this war, I definitely married into Burgundy, gaining a lot of free territories. Then, I designate our rivals. Novgorod, the Teutonic Order, I allied with Poland, which will help start our European policy, and sent my diplomats to the Polish court to gain favors, as I plan to attack Moscow with Poland's help, but don't want to give them any land. While Sweden is still economically weak, I will reduce army maintenance and fortresses during peace times. In Stockholm, I will introduce Renaissance institutions, we will develop Dalaskogen later, always keeping that province in mind. However, we need to specifically develop our missions for cheaper development of such terrain. This mission right here. Of course I'll mess everything up and forget about it. Oh, I got a cardinal! How nice! I'm manually claiming Gdansk! And now we have the Renaissance in Stockholm! Vasa on the English throne? That's a bit of luck. Unless the Tudors take over, I want to point out that Gdansk is our subject of interest. Overall, I might as well take Königsberg and Mimel too. I engage in my first war against Poland and Burgundy, targeting the Teutonic Order. My main goal is obviously Gdansk, and the rest is just a bonus. I need at least that one province. I also attack Gotland in the meantime, though I know I won't get there, hoping the war will last five years. I have a long way around. I achieve a personal union over Burgundy in 1457. What more could I want? And it's even loyal. I introduce institutions and select the first idea for Sweden at the start. It's worth considering one of two options, either innovative or economic. That's why I keep focusing on administrative actions to develop them quickly. I plan to create a very strong infantry for Sweden, so I choose innovative first, because I'll pair it with quality. And here we have a policy that first strengthens our infantry, and without doing much, I've become a great northern power. No, how could I not use this? You know what it would be like if I had a union over England and Burgundy at the beginning of playing Sweden. Unfortunately, I still have a small war with Austria over Burgundy. I'm not giving up this rich duchy. But I didn't expect Castile in this war. Oops, little Sweden. Yet so many wars at once. Who would have thought? From the Teutonic Order, I take two provinces, a lot of money, and humiliate them. The worst part is that I always have to go around to participate in all these wars. We need to establish a passage through the Danes as soon as possible. Maybe my armies won't be needed here. The first reform is obviously higher taxes for the nobility, not this then. Come on, really? Rebellion? Back we go. All right, to not prolong this war. From Austria this time, mercifully, only war reparations. I also start my invasion of Novgorod. Our forces are comparable at this moment. Curious if Burgundy will join. If not, I'll call the Poles. We can't let the Russian troops combine because we can't handle them. But we can definitely defeat their army one by one, literally breaking them apart. Moscow falls and I take these two provinces and a lot of money. This finally allows me to pay off my entire debt again, expand my trade centers to increase trade, and in the capital, I'll even build a church. Then my army isn't even home yet, and I'm declaring war on the Danes. Maybe not a smart move, but after all, I am a fool. Poland will help, and the Czechs. Unfortunately, I didn't manage to introduce fasting, missing a bit of prestige, this time anyway. I don't take much from the Danes, only enough to then achieve a union over Norway. I can't believe I'm doing this, but I'm actually defending the Danish-Norwegian union, because I'm not sure if this mission wouldn't change to territorial claims, and that would be weak. After developing the innovative idea to the third level which gives me cheaper technology I will also develop administrative technology up to the seventh level as it comes I make Riga and the remnants of the Livonian order my vassals which basically allows me to establish the privilege of strong duchies finally I also have the opportunity to build workshops in our Sweden and we have a lot of such valuable provinces a whole eight and who said Sweden is that country where you easily and quickly earn money unfortunately Ivan III the great ascended to the Russian throne quite quickly that's not good but anyway I'll try to attack the Muscovites and recover land for the order and a lot of money. I don't know where the Russian troops are, but I know one thing. They sold some forts, which gives me an open path to Moscow. After selecting my favorite tax reform, I introduce 50% taxes in every province. Why am I at war with Poland? Well, what can I say? I end the war with Moscow, recovering the entire Livonian order and taking a lot of money from them. Moscow is definitely my favorite bank at this moment. Time to expand to the west, east, and for 
for some reason, the Polish-Hungarian Union suddenly ended. What's going on? Someone's king died, that's probably the summary of the entire history of Poland, they'll lose Lithuania soon. I'm going to save this union, because honestly, it will all be mine someday. I really wanted to save the Polish-Lithuanian Union, but they just made peace a moment ago, and my troops were already on their way here. Norway wants me to support its independence. But we all know my real goal, establishing a union over Norway, and I definitely want to show them the Swedish way, which they might not like. In the meantime, I recommend you do something like this. Whenever you're close to the cap of diplomatic points, develop these provinces in this region. They have iron, they have copper, they're quite nice, and fall slightly behind in diplomatic technology by a maximum of two levels to then introduce it cheaply. Especially since to complete our missions in Daleskogan, we must develop this province extensively. My third or fourth war with the Danes. Who's counting? It's just a formality. Because I have total dominance of the fleet and army. During all events, I click on the development that will speed up the Protestant Reformation. And most importantly, when you're establishing a union over Norway, capture at least this province, their capital and this one, and then money. And another province, but I'll show you that later. The Norwegian capital has a share in the Lübeck trade. And from a personal union, we can't take either trade or provinces. And this province is needed for us to complete this mission, which will ultimately give us cheaper province development. Poland really lost the union over Lithuania. I can't believe it. Since I was already earning quite a lot with my Sweden, I begin training the army instead of keeping it on low maintenance. For one of the later missions, we need 50 army professionalism, and I'm a bit short. Sweden is usually not a good country for developing provinces. Since I've already improved relations, I'm now selecting this mission. As a result, I'll establish a historic friendship with the Norwegians, and it's clear that Swedish plans for the Baltic Sea Basin have gained momentum. I could pay off the clergy's debt now, but honestly, I'm going to change religion within the next four 40 years anyway, so why bother? I stabilized the kingdom so now I can focus on the matter of the Polish crown. Although being the king of Poland sounds cool, at this moment when Poland no longer has a union over Lithuania, it's not that profitable. Coexistence isn't really my path either. Therefore I decide to conquer Poland, sorry, but either way I would have to conquer half of Poland or introduce my dynasty to that throne to have a union over it. Without Lithuania, it's totally not worth it, especially since there will be no commonwealth. This way, at least Polish culture will be be an acceptable culture when I conquer 15 provinces. I'm also rebuilding my fleet, I'm getting rid of all the galleys and mainly switching to merchant ships and about 5 heavy ships, that should be enough. In March 1489, I attack Moscow again. My goal is conquests, but primarily money from that country. Moscow is really a nice country to conquer because it's two technologies behind me. They have 5, I have 7. For conquering the entire Muscovite region, we get two acceptable cultures. In the meantime, I also managed to complete a mission to integrate the Sami culture into our main one, which helps us develop that region. Oh no, do I have to do this too? Will I really miss that one province? Moscow essentially surrenders without a fight, not a single battle. My vassals do whatever they want. Moscow has fallen, let it burn. As rebellions start to erupt in the country, I'm expanding my borders significantly. Then I'll visit Poland, at least capturing Mimel. Actually, I'm gathering funds to expand Dils Kogan, although there was some trick here. Wait a moment. Interesting. Moscow is now at war with Lithuania and the Great Horde. France will get involved. I refuse. However, it'll have to capture some forts in Burgundy. Since I didn't expect France in this war, I'm increasing recruitment in all my provinces. Now it's time to face the French armies, which have high morale but much lower discipline. Oh, the losses are horrifying, and unfortunately, we are in a regency. Our wonderful king died during this war. The regency is pathetic for the next five years. Fortunately, for some reason, the French troops kept splitting into smaller armies, which I easily destroyed. Luckily, Sweden has this thing where during the regency, our nobility put forth at least a better ruler. I also managed to trap the French troops through that fortress, win a battle against them, and then defeat their provinces nearby. This opened the way to Paris almost entirely. The fortress in Chalan was sacrificed as a trap for the Polish troops, literally their entire entire army is here. To put it mildly, Moscow ended up very badly after the wars with Lithuania and the Great Horde. Paris has fallen, but honestly I plan to severely punish France. I even managed to burn Paris. Eh, they recaptured the fortress. Well, okay, we'll heavily indebt France and attack it again in five years. 
From Poland, I'm acquiring the following provinces to release the vassal Mazovia there, since France came out very battered from this war and my troops are already nearby. We attack Scotland with England's help to capture Orkney. France defends them. In the meantime, I'll deal with economic matters in our country, because this is the moment when we can not only start building manufacturers, since we can really build a lot of them, but we'll also very quickly research these manufacturers at level 11 technology. Wow, France completely sank my fleet. Now what was this event doing here. We can develop the mining level by one, get manufactories, which we'll research soon anyway, or increase production by four. No, not really. I'll ask to increase the mining level by one. And progress to the third level was preserved. Such a little trick. Wait, is this progress like I paid for the second level? Oh no, I literally spent 2,500 ducats just now. This is too good a trick. But it must be admitted, this significantly reduces the cost of our artillery and increases our income. From this one province, we make 12 gold. Again, we take only money from France, unfortunately unfortunately, because that province costs a lot in terms of aggressive expansion. Nothing? Hello? I'm gaining a foothold in Scotland. Yes, I'll continue to conquer it. And honestly, this is only so that just in case I have an opportunity to take power in England, I'll have a place to transport my troops. Meanwhile, Protestantism has emerged in the world. To my misfortune, three centers appeared very quickly while I was at war. Nonetheless, I'm changing my religion to Protestantism, and I immediately purchased the Defender of the Faith to convert my country as quickly as possible. Just before the end of the Age of Discovery, I'm burning development in all my provinces. Administrative, because in the next era, taxes will not be as profitable. Military reforms of Gustavus Adolphus will completely focus on developing our army. Although alternatives could also be interesting, it's time to delve further into the Russian region. Oh my god, what happened to Poland? No. Never mind, I moved to recapture territories from Mazovia and then dragged Lithuania into the war. Just before the start of the new Reformation era, I'm beginning a new golden age for Sweden, and in the next era, thanks to this mission, we'll be able to convert our provinces faster. Hey, they added this solution for everyone. Wow. Hmm. Maybe it's time to make Sweden as Norse. We, Sweden, will stand on the side of the Reformation. So we choose to, sir. Unless you want to go for religious tolerance. And actually, if we combine this with humanist ideals, we'd have a really tolerant country. But I'm very tempted to maybe become the Protestant Emperor of Germany. We also built a university in Uppsala, in Skåne as well. I chose the offensive idea as my third option, although economic or religious alternatives would also have been good. This was mainly for discipline and siege speed. The troop limit will also be useful, while the rest is somewhat pointless. Now, I'm starting to have really strong generals. Unfortunately, I have to perform a trick here by releasing Denmark from one province and then making them my military vassal. This is because Lübeck is a very expensive region to conquer, and I prefer to acquire these territories by liberating them for the Danish. Moreover, the neighboring principalities don't like my conquests. Using a short peace period, I solved the peasant problem in our country, which gave us strong bonuses to grain, fish, and cows production. I can also carry out further Vasa reforms, focusing on centralizing power in our hands. The Danes are becoming our vassals. I also completed the administrative development of our country, resulting in a very strong army. Provinces in the Krakow trade region are added to trade companies, and Krakow is peacefully vassalized. Why not? There was a minor change in plans because Austria started defending Lübeck against my ambitions. So I will focus on converting all these countries to the one true religion, except maybe for Lithuania. Let the Czechs help. Ha ha ha. Oh well, Lithuanian diplomacy failed, as I now have full information about it. I ruthlessly use this to besiege all their provinces. The first development of the era reduces the costs of provinces with a different religion than ours. Fortunately, minor principalities easily convert to Protestantism. Where is the emperor's army running to? Come here. The papist army no longer exists, and Austria paid a huge price for joining this war, as the Habsburgs just lost the right to many possessions. It's time for more military reforms for our army, allowing us to recruit special units, Carolian infantry, which is surprisingly weak. I acquired a lot of territory for the Danes, which essentially led to Denmark's downfall. But no, I don't want to click that mission yet, not until I integrate Denmark. Unfortunately, this is the end of the Polish Kingdom, now under the rule of the Swedes, Hungarians and Germans. I also start the great industrialization process of Sweden. Specifically, every province with iron or copper must have a manufactory, or oh, it says so here. And so, an opportunity arises. We attack England, 
Oh, the fall of Vienna. We gained a union over England and almost no one cares. I can't believe I will be waging wars against hordes here instead of with Moscow. Moscow is a vassal of the Golden Horde. I cut through their army like butter. Literally. They are running away. No, I got you. I've been waiting for this religious war and can't wait any longer. I can recruit a cool company and it doesn't cost us any professionalism. Just this cavalry. Why do I need this? I take it back. Our infantry can really be strong. I just need to grant these two privileges, but I'll be able to have fewer of them. Wait, wait, wait. I was the one who decided when the Protestant League would form. I had such a decision. Just don't know where from. Oh my god. Possibly it was from this mission. I just didn't read it properly. Come on, join. I want this war. I'm still waiting for the Ottoman Empire to join. But unfortunately, for some reason, Osman doesn't want to join the Catholic League. So I'll start the war. But honestly, it will be incredibly easy to victory. Cool bonuses. Honestly, I'm not even attacking Vienna. I'm going straight for battles with France. And from what I see, France isn't defending its territory but fleeing to Venice. So let's defend our ally by utterly destroying the enemy's army. This Swedish army is so powerful, unbelievable. In the meantime, let's convert the countries of minor principalities. Oh, there will be a battle with the French, which I won't show you as usual. Well, we dealt them nice losses, you won't believe it, but France keeps running from my army because I destroy every one of its armies and I regret that you can't convert France in such a war. Actually, a casus belli that would reduce costs for each occupied province would be really cool. This time, France France will pay because it's literally all under occupation. We take one province and deprive it of Naples. I'll wait until the end of my regency because I'm curious if I'll accidentally become the new emperor. Because a woman is ruling in my country, so definitely, but they still don't vote for me. Too bad. So I enforce Protestant religious supremacy and change Austria's religion to Protestantism. It was a really bloody war. Although I don't know my losses because I can't click the shield, hello. And they finally came to their senses. I became the new emperor of the empire and now I'm improving relations with all countries of our religion? Wow. I'll start the war by recovering lands for me. And actually, at this point, we can also join the empire. Which isn't a bad idea, just why aren't they voting for me? This is definitely a guy. The dominant religion is Protestantism. And suddenly they started voting for me. I don't know why. We'll carry out the first imperial reform, although it's still dropping for now. But that's because we have some empire lands to recover, and a few heretical states to convert. But it's not worth doing until the centers disappear. I'll first strike at the Ottoman Empire, to recover an imperial province. It's definitely too easy for me. Definitely too easy. Pathetic empire. The war easily won. I'm practically without losses. This is probably tough love. I occupy their capital and they love me. Wunderbar. We became the hegemon of Eastern Europe. Somehow all the centers of reformation disappeared. They were still there five years ago. By the way, I got a certain achievement. I can't believe I didn't have it earlier. Poland returned to the world maps. The birth of a Scandinavian empire. And I don't dominated the entire Baltic coastline, and that's the birth of a Scandinavian nation. For reference, this is what Swedish ideas looked like, and this is what Scandinavian ideas looked like. Much better for conducting conquests. Really very strong ideas. Wow. And our mission tree has expanded. What a cool path for further play as the Scandinavian emperor. But in this episode, I'll show you how to dominate the entire China region with Korea and use a certain secret mechanic for incredible development of this country.